Okay, so welcome to the section of the podcast where we're going to start to talk about the decade in review. Everyone's doing them. This is what happened in the last 10 years. Um, So we're just going to have a look year by year about what's gone on and um, talk about some of our highlights, bits that we like, bits of the characters that we liked, uh, bits we didn't enjoy, all that kind of stuff. Um, And my original plan was just to do this in one episode and go through the whole decade, but I thought that's got the potential to last forever and ever and ever. And once I started making the notes about it the other day, um, it it certainly felt like that probably wasn't the best option to do. So we're going to make this a discussion in three parts, taking three years each, and stuff 2019, not going to be part of it because we've already just been speaking about you. Yeah. So this week, um, to start things off, we're going to go right back to the beginning of the decade in 2010. Uh, obviously a big year for Coronation Street with the 50th anniversary. Uh, and then 2011 and then 2012, which is also a pretty important year in Coronation Street because it was the year that the Conversation Street podcast first started. And Coronation Street as a whole just got that much richer because of our, yeah, uh, the, the, our contribution. Uh, yeah. I think it's... I don't understand why you've chosen to do this chronologically. Well, how how would you have done it? <laughs> I just think you're being a bit boring. You should be a bit more avant-garde. <laughs> well, I could have done like this week. We're going to talk about the characters. This week we're going to talk about the stories. But I just, I just like, I didn't know how to do it, and I started typing things. And... I'm just giving you a hard time. Of course, you should do it chronologically. <laughs> I should never know. Um, so, 2010, massive year for Coronation Street. Well, I don't think there's. It's worth bringing up the whole tram crash and going into it in huge amount of details because we talked about that fairly recently on the podcast didn't we where we were when we were talking about the um what we wanted with the 60th anniversary compared to some of the other anniversaries and um and and we were pretty much in agreement that the 50th anniversary was done jolly well the tram crash was an excellent stunt it brought lots of stories to a head on the night they had the live episodes um molly's death um, it was fantastic. And, and looking back at the rest of 2010 when I was doing my, my research for this, it actually seemed like it was a pretty strong year on the whole for Corrie. And I don't know whether it was a case of the rose-tinted spectacles and some of the characters going, oh, I remember when they used to be in it. But yeah, there seemed to be some quite big stories here. Now in 2010, um, <coughs> Phil Collinson took over from Kim Crowther as producer and he was kind of brought in to, you know, give give Cory the shake up that it needed for the for the big fiftieth anniversary. And one of the things that he put into place straight away apparently was really strict rules on script access to prevent <coughs> leaks before the fiftieth anniversary. And just reading this made me think this is what they need to do right now. Somebody needs to be brought in or Ian McLeod needs to do something. If there are if there can be script stricter rules, or even stricter rules on script access that would stop these leaks from happening, this is the year to do it. I do not want to know huge details about what's going to happen in the, in the 60th anniversary until that night rolls up. Um, there was um, there was loads of publicity for the tram <coughs> crash. It was called... Do you remember they used the tagline for funerals and a wedding for it? And uh, it was... Um, a pun. A bit, well, yeah, and then it was a bit of a letdown because they didn't really have four people die. And they well, did, they, they, like, it they was said the tram was a, no, the, no, they said there was a taxi driver that was uh, caught up in it somehow. And it was like, we don't care about him. And his yeah. wife, widow was like, oh. But yeah, very, very well done. Also in 2010 was when Coronation Street switched to HD for the first time back in April. And they had a new title sequence and everything as well. So behind the scenes, there was an awful lot going on, which I think <coughs> so is what it needed. Um, as as you are the lady, Gemma, and you can have on my look at my list of stories here. Is there anything here that stands out to you particularly for also being a? No. Uh, don't say that. Oh, Just because you're friend. sick today. Oh, I've been sick for a while. <coughs> um. Wow. Well, there was a funny bit when Joe died in in a lake. <laughs> Tell me more. Got hit by a boom, which I having done my Duke of Edinburgh award with a sailing segment in it, can tell you they're very dangerous. Yes, I've, I've done a bit of sailing um, when I've taken children out on the water and I'm not very good at it. Um, this was when... That was a, <coughs> that was a funny Joe death. was setting... Joe McIntyre... Tina's old dad. Gail's husband. Bought a boat, called it Gale Force, planned a insurance job and died. That was that was a, a pathetic end to a, what amounted to a bit of a pathetic character, wasn't it? And it was a bit sad because he'd been um, 
led down the route of uh, drug addiction, hadn't he? Do you remember when he read, he raided the, 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 yeah. uh, the, the... Went the, to the medical centre and stole yeah, some Yeah, it was drugs. like proto Ali. Uh, <coughs> and that also ended up with Gail in prison as well, which Is was... Is that um, the same time that Tracy was in prison? That was the same time that Tracy was in prison, yeah. So Gail finds that Tracy's there as a roommate, and I think Tracy tried she's to... She's like, you're cramping my style, Grandma. She... Um, pretended that Gail had confessed, I think, to killing Joe to try and get a reduced sentence, if mm-hmm. I remember rightly. And then it then it when it found out that, <coughs> that Tracy was making it all up, she got beaten up. But that was an a reintroduction of Kate Ford into the show because she obviously hadn't been in it since the was it two thousand and seven or something where she clocked um Charlie Stubbs with the statue. So it was quite cool to see Tracy back in that. She was she she was brought in a couple of times during that year before a big return in December because she was also let out of prison for Blanche's funeral which I suppose was another quite big moment for Coronation Street in 2010 the end of Blanche although I think it had been the year before that Maggie had made her last appearance on the street and I think I think it was 2009 that she died but they had to wait a little while before they killed off the character so that was um a significant but, moment. Yes, <coughs> and I think that's when they also had June Whitfield come in as one of um, Blanche's ten, friends, do you remember? Four o'clock, three o'clock, twelve what, o'clock, one, one o'clock One o'clock club, club I think. So yeah, the, that, was a, that was quite a big story, as was the, uh, the Siege of Underworld, because the Tony Gordon stuff was all building up um, at that point. Very explosive. I like yeah. the, the Siege of Underworld. That was cool. And they had a Loki from Vicar of Dibley playing his henchman who got shot. Oh, yeah. That was that was mega dramatic. Carla tied up Hayley in there as well, yeah. wasn't she? Fire. And that, yeah, and then having um, that, that shot of Tony Gordon walking back into the burning building. That, yeah. was, a, that, was, a really, that was a really good end to a bad villain. And yeah. I think um, since Richard Hillman, they, they, they'd wanted to have another big bad and I think he was the first kind of villain that really came close to mm. reaching Hillman <laughs> levels. I know he obviously wasn't as as big as Hillman. Um, he 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 was he was up there, and um, that was a, a very cool exit for him. Even though they did have to delay it for a week because of the uh, Cumbria shootings, didn't they? So I, th- I think it was probably the right thing to do looking back on it. But it was all built up to be a, the big post-Watershed week, maybe, was it? And they had to put it back for a little while. Um, what else do we have that year? We also had um, <clears throat> another villain, John State, posing as Colin Fishwick. Oh, the yeah. Of his naughty... Yeah, the, the John State kind of stuff mostly came to a head in 2011, but that was when he was... Um, I can't remember when the character came into the show. It must have been 2008, 2009 or so, but this is when he wanted... He wanted to teach so much, didn't he? I can't remember that the, the, he took on the identity of one of the other teachers at school who'd gone away to Canada and then he came back or something. But uh, yeah, John John State was such a fun villain. Idiot. Yeah, uh, in, incompetent villain with all these um, accidental murders, which I, I think probably were more 2011, I can't remember. But um, there, there's quite a few character names on this list where I look back and go, ah, oh, like Becky as well, because um, in 2010 was when <coughs> she and Steve were going through all the problems trying to adopt, and I think when Anna and Eddie Windass also like competing with them to yeah, to they become had, like, foster it was parents. Like there was only one kid in the world to be adopted, and they had to have a competition to see who was the best parent. <laughs> yeah, but in the end, they ended up um, buying Max because this was the. This was the year that Kylie came into the show, I think. Yeah, and she had a spare kid. Yeah, she had a spare kid that she didn't want anything to do with them anymore. So they, they bought the son. That, that, that seemed quite big. And, and Max was so cute back then, I remember. I'll give you two pence for him now. He was lovely, yeah. I don't know, I don't know what's going on with him. <coughs> um, I, I suppose <coughs> another big one for the 50th anniversary, which I don't remember much about now. The stories we've talked about so far, I've got vivid-ish memories of them. But the whole thing with... Ken discovering his other son and grandson is really fuzzy in my mind and because uh, uh, he had this son called Lawrence who was played by William Roach's son Linus and then Lawrence's <coughs> son was James who was played by James Roach and it seemed to just Which be a was his grandson it seemed to I can't remember whether he was or whether they were both his sons but anyway um oh. William Roach's that is it seemed to be a way of saying, oh, it's the 50th anniversary, wouldn't it be funny if 
our longest running cast member got a chance to act alongside his real family. And then it turned out that Lawrence was a massive homophobe because James was gay and Lawrence couldn't accept it. And I just don't remember much about it now. I, I don't even remember what the characters look like. Which kind of I goes... just have this memory of them all standing in the living room sort of looking shocked at one another. Yeah, it it does kind of... And sort of disappointed. It does kind of get, prove to me that sometimes some of these moves or that, you know, the, the, casting somebody for casting's sake isn't necessarily going to always make the most compelling of stories. And also, since it happened, how much have these other children been mentioned or this other child and grandson been mentioned? Not at all. It's almost like an extra twig grew on the family, uh, the Barlow family tree. And it fell off. And it fell off and it, and, and that was it. It's, it's turned it, into a mushroom log. Yeah, it was, it was, I suppose, uh, one of these, one of these retconny things that they, because it was, he found out that his old girlfriend from the 60s, Susan, he found a letter from her or something saying, oh, I had I a, I, never, I had I a never child. I never found out about the secret son. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, that, that didn't go down so well, well with me. There was love in the air in the form of Roy and Haley's legal wedding. Oh yeah, we that was nice. finally got, got to see. Um, but there's that when Haley did a pump wagoning to get to the, uh, get to the been. church in time. I think it must have been. Also with romance, and I think people look badly about, um, down on this one, was the whole Mulvin saga when uh, Kevin and Molly were seeing each other. And uh, that was a... It, that was a huge story at the time, wasn't it? Kevin and Molly having an affair that seemed to pretending to be running about. go on for months and months and months. Yeah, they were they were having it off while pretending to go off uh, jogging together. And um, as as icky and misjudged as that story was, it did lead to one of my favourite moments in the tram crash episode when. Uh, when Sally finds out about it and leaves Molly there to die. Brilliant. That was, that was a very grisly Next end time to that character. Sally's acting like she's so superior. Mm. Just remember that. She left a woman to die mm. in rubble. Um, we also had Jack dying that year as well. Didn't quite manage it to the anniversary. We got, got within spitting distance of it, but that's, as you know, one of, one of my favourite scenes when he's With his swamp duck. Exactly. Um, and uh, another memorable exit there, I think, was uh, Natasha, who was another character that, if I think back to it, the think back to her, I don't really remember much about her. Apart she was from I remember really thinking... interesting because she was a minor character who had one of the most spectacular stuff off exits of all time. Yeah, she didn't really have anything to do in the few <coughs> years that she was in the show, and she was just kind of hanging around in the uh, in the salon. No, she was oh, she, she worked right. in the salon. But then she, when she um, she got together with Nick, she had this massive ending story where she got pregnant, then she had an abortion, but then she got married to... Then she got engaged to Nick and didn't tell him that she'd had an abortion. And then, was it uh, Gail went on the computer records at the medical centre or something yeah, to find out about yeah, her? And then, and then Nat- Natasha has this spectacular exit, like you said, where she kind of tells everybody exactly what she thinks a- about them before leaving in a blaze of glory. Yeah. But she's completely, she's the sort of character that's... Not many people remember. No, nobody, nobody really remembers her apart from an exit, and that's not really what you want to be Well, no, I mean, she's going to be remembered for anything. An amazing exit where you basically give two finger salutes to everybody and then leave. It's not very many, I mean, we've talked about damp squib exits especially when you can tell the the actors think that they're going to be back pretty soon and they just sort of meekly go off and attack at the back of the cab and you know Mm. they don't make a big song and a dance about it too much but i think that she had one of my favorite taxi exits of all time because she did go off in the taxi and she sort of like wasn't quite as though she set fire to everything and left it burning but you know, metaphorically, she did. Mm. We also said goodbye that year to Kelly Crabtree. She had quite... She, it was sad that she had to leave, but I think Tupelli decided that her character wasn't going the way that she wanted her to. And um, I remember she had a really cool exit shot with, like, a, a, a like a crane shot and and looking down on Kelly in the street and saying, I'm off, legs. I'm the one with the legs. And she kind of straps off towards the viaduct. But um, it was kind of sad that she never came back. We saw the back of Teresa Bryant who was part of the, the, the final lingering bit of the Morton clan. I never really got on with her. Um, we also saw the the back of Jesse Chadwick. There's just a few names here that I, I think 
some people will be going, oh, yeah, I completely forgot about them. Jesse Chadwick was the, uh, the guy who Eileen was going out with who dressed as a cowboy and did the higher-lower stuff. It seems like a different, a really different age, yeah. doesn't it? It seems like so long ago. <laughs> Ted Page, he was Audrey's yeah. husband. And... Yeah, is he still alive? Who knows? Well, he um, was one of the. He was um, a pioneer in the world of um, characters who were secretly gay their whole lives. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, but and we also had some new characters that year as well. This was uh, two thousand and ten. Was the year that we saw the Armstrong family introduced onto the street. Is yeah. it Owen and Katie? Um, we had Brian Packham, 2010. I can't Brilliant. believe it's his 10th anniversary. It doesn't feel to me like he's... No, I know, yeah. And I know he did have that break, didn't he? Because yeah. Kate Oates brought him back. But 10 years of Brian Packham, we used to like him a lot more back then. Yeah. Obviously, Hope was born, Liam was born that year. Um, and then we had the, the Grey family, which is another one that I think people might have forgotten. Cheryl, Chris and, and their son, Russ, who um, was an, uh, brought in as an attempt to give a family to uh, Lloyd, um, well, particularly Cheryl and Russ, and then... Cheryl. Uh, Cheryl, and then uh, Chris came on the scene later on, but they've... With a brain tumour. Yeah, I think the brain tumour was <clears throat> 2011, but I, I quite like them. Um, Lewis Archer left. Yeah, he because he, he's had three stints, so that was the end of him. Uh, and then we had a couple of returns that year as well. Mary came back as a regular in 2010, um, we had a little appearance from Jackie Dobbs. I think it was Jackie's last appearance in 2010. And um, old Kieran McCarty came back on the scene as well. Um, trying to remember. I, th- I think they're the main... That that feels like quite a strong year to me. Lots, Yeah, lots of really big characters and explosive... Though, I mean, there were two really massive explosive stunts. Yeah, with the underworld, underworld yeah. stuff and the, and the tram crash. Um, I mean, anything where Becky was a major character is a good year in in my book, to be honest. Um, Roy and Haley's wedding was lovely. Um, Jack's death. That, I, 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 if the sixtieth anniversary year can be anywhere near as good as I'm kind of remembering that to be, then um, we're in for a bit of a treat in the next twelve months. Um, so yeah, that was two thousand and ten. Let's move on to two thousand and eleven then. Um, and not much going on big behind the scenes here. I think it was a bit of a come down from 2010. They still kept the same producer. The big news that had broken, I think, the previous year was that they were planning to move Coronation Street from Key Street to the Media City Studios, where it currently is now. And in the <coughs> beginning of 2011 was when they, they broke the ground at uh, Media City and started building, and it took a long time for it all to come together. Um main stories that year I'm kind of looking down my list and seeing what jumps out to me and I, and I don't think there's as much that that stands out as as much as the well, previous year did but the big the big bad was Frank Foster who was another evil oh, yeah. factory boss he was yeah I think they were kind of trying to repeat Tony Gordon in a way weren't they with Frank Foster because that was the guy a, from the bill yeah and Andrew Lancel played him I, I think he was a it very was a good job did a good job yeah he was very good at playing evil he, um because he that was all with him he, he uh, Maria accused him of raping her but it was it was a bit grey wasn't it about where or, or no he she accused him of coming on to her when she kind of dressed up to go to a business meeting with him or something and I don't know whether he put his hand on her knee or something but then he accused her of rape but then by the end of the year um I think he that, accused her of raping so he, she accused him of rape but then she was singing his praises by the end of the year so it was a little bit it like was the, a bit it, it's a precursor to what we're seeing currently with Maria and Gary that she she sure does pick them because she was she was involved in Tony Gordon as well, wasn't she? Yeah. <laughs> um, we also had the end of Claire Peacock after poor hubby died in the tram crash. She runs off to France yeah. because I can't remember why. Oh, because she'd um, she'd hit Tracy. There, there was a funny, there was a cool who done it at the just at New Year that year where um, somebody attacked Tracy. And um, there were lots of people who it could have been because she'd she'd shown up um, just after Christmas and she did that awful the best the, the best arrival for two thousand years and then um, yeah Tra- Claire had punched her and then everyone had to smuggle her off to France. 
She's yeah, they didn't care about that in France. Yeah, no. I th- I think I might be misremembering that Maria and Frank's Froster stuff. You know, maybe she didn't end up liking him. No, it was Carla. Carla ended up. I thought with it Frank. was something to do. Yeah, with Carla. Carla ended up with Frank Foster, and he <coughs> did rape her. Yeah, he did. Um, at the end of the year, yeah, I think that Maria <coughs> was trying to put her off him. Oh, Eileen, so this I I never forgot forgot this, but everyone else did. She embezzled money from Owens Construction Company. I know. I thought you'd she like that. She did the books for it, and um, she got arrested for that. Yeah. There was also. A um a visa marriage storyline when Graham married Sheen the the Chinese she was she a student she was yeah she was a friend of Tina's I think they went to a restaurant and she was working there and then it turned <laughs> out that she was going to get evicted so she needed to um get married you mean so evicted from the country evicted from the country yeah. deported that's what is they the, call is it. the actual word. Um, and, and Tina, who was going out with Graham at the time because he'd kind of rescued her from her depression after yeah. Joe had died, Tina had said, look, Graham, why don't you marry her? It's not going to be it's not going to be real. He's still going to be my boyfriend. But if you marry her, then she can stay in the country. And um, he ended up falling for Sheen because I think at this she point... She was lo- lovely, Sheen. She, she was, but she's got a really bad rap among the Coronation Street fan community everybody hates this oh, story well, and why? i remember both of us really enjoying it i, like I thought sheen. that sheen was lovely i thought yeah. that graham was hilarious and every, <clears throat> i think graham is generally looked upon favorably I wish by curry back. fans but I'd love sheen to see really really sheen wasn't back. we don't have very many asian no characters. she was coronation street's first chinese character and i'm struggling to think of if there's been anybody since actually um but yeah, I, I really enjoyed uh, all that stuff. That they, they had their double wedding with David and Kylie, which which was I remember being weird, thinking was weird at the time because Kylie had disappeared off around the tram crash time, <clears throat> and then David sort of goes off to Ibiza or something, was it, and comes back saying, oh, "I got engaged to a cage dancer called Candy," and then it turns out that it's actually Kylie. So yeah. it was a Strange coincidence. Did he get he engaged or did he get married? Yeah, he got engaged to her and, and then... Married her over here. Uh, yeah, married her over here in this double wedding with Graham, Graham and Sheen. And then um, Graham and Sheen left. Boo! Yeah, they, they left because they'd fallen in love with each other. I think at the time as well, I was getting a bit sick of Tina McIntyre and I used to really enjoy Tina, but this was the time when she was really, really being... into yeah, the limelight. Overused, I think, a little bit here. And um, when Graham went off with Sheen instead of her, I was kind of thinking, yeah, boy, Tina, she's a bit of a piece of work, isn't she? And we weren't supposed to be thinking that. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I, I really enjoyed that stuff. Um, we had a bit of Sophie, um, well, we had a big uh, tease because Sophie was exploring her sexuality. She was very religious, but she realised that she was gay. Um, she attempted suicide on the church roof because she couldn't reconcile her religious yeah, beliefs with Emily her Bishop sexuality had to talk her down or something. I think but that eventually she, what I think that she actually fell off the roof she was going to throw herself off the roof but then she fell off anyway it's a bit like Joe going out on the boat the previous year pretending to kill himself and then actually going through with it accidentally and God's like going it wasn't me it wasn't me I don't <laughs> mind honestly um she, there was supposed to be Corrie's first lesbian wedding which they still haven't had no I know and it's nearly day, 10 still years still later it, yeah. they've not had a gay wedding well, they in Coronation had Street the two teens absconding to did they go to Scotland no to no no they, they didn't they, oh, they, no. they, they, they had a, a big ceremony here but um, Sophie had cold feet because she, I think she'd kissed Amber, Dev's daughter, and then she was, couldn't decide whether she could go through with it or something. So, yeah. so Sean's they like, stuff you young. then. Yeah, and then they they were very young at the time. Sean was, Sean was cool. Yeah, yeah, she, she was good. And there's been no kind of... No, nothing mentioned no, since. Nothing mentioned since of that. Jim, bro- Jim robbed a building society. Yeah, Why not? classic. I, I I was you know I was talking about the Graham and Sheen story, which people don't really like, but I've got a bit of a soft spot for another one. I think that didn't go down too well with the curry viewers was the the cross dressing story with Audrey's boyfriend Mark, and I remember finding that really fascinating and because um, it was it was very new for Coronation Street. It's the thing they hadn't done before, but she ends up going out with this guy who she later discovers is is a crossdresser. Yep. And although the ending of it felt very rushed when she revealed his secret to everyone because she was like, I, I am not going to be ashamed of going out with, with Mark. Yes, it's true. He's a crossdresser. And he was like, no, I wasn't ready to share this yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm off. off. And I was like, oh, is that it then? This um, was very interesting because I don't reckon they would do it this way now. If no, they had I know. 
because um, I don't think that... I, but I thought it was really well done for the time and the way that um, society was at the time. Mm. I think cross-dressing. Um, there's a certain... I don't know. From my own experience, there's a certain generation of men where cross-dressing was kind of a thing that some of them did, mm. right? And I don't reckon it's like that anymore. But Mark was kind of like one of the last cross-dressers. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. From my experience, not everybody. Yeah. Um, but um, I, really I thought it was really that. good because it was like a struggle for acceptance um, from from Audrey. But he didn't want it from... But he wasn't, yeah, I thought it was good. Yeah, because that was how Claudia was all involved in that as well, because I think, I think that Mark might have been Claudia's boyfriend first, and then she found out about the secret, and then didn't want to Because it's not the same thing as being transgender, obviously. No, no. Um, That's a completely different Mm. set of circumstances. Um, Another massive story, which I absolutely adored, despite its obvious silliness this year, was the, the John Stape saga conclusion. Um, it was, I mean, it had been silly enough the year before when, because uh, he, I, I think at the end of 2010 with the tram crash, that's when he'd killed Charlotte Hoyle. Was it, was, was it during 2010, that was when Colin Fishwick actually died and then he and Charlotte had to take his body wrapped up in a roller carpet, stuck it underneath the uh, underworld. That was brilliant. I loved all that stuff. And then in 2011, um, they have to d- dig up Underworld for some reason or other. And then Colin's body is found. Or, or no, John has to go and take the body, <coughs> gets Fizz to help him dump it in, mm. a, in, a, in a lake or something or in a river. Um, also that year, John ties up Chesney and Charlotte's parents in their uh, cellar. And and then he ju- goes to hospital and jumps off a hospital roof, but somehow survives this massive drop. He obviously had whatever Billy was on a couple of Christmases ago. John had had a bit of, um, and then Bailey. Fizz and then Fizz gets thrown in prison because she's accused of, um, being in on some scam that John was pulling. So the whole free free Fizz was supposed to be a repeat of the Deirdre thing but I don't think it went down quite as well then John comes back and he dies in a car crash it was all utterly utterly ridiculous and it was during this year as well that I think he ended up killing other people accidentally it was so silly but they embraced the silliness of it without it coming across as being too campy and ridiculous it was a really well plotted story I think and it lasted for a very 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 long time and it's a sort sometimes you get stories that last as long as this one does and you get fed up of it and I'm sure there's some people were but I was invested in that story from start to finish because she is a fellow teacher well yes of course they had a bit of a misstep this year a big one when they introduced the Price family oh gosh yeah they came and it really was just Stella that, that was the problem but she was a big enough problem to taint the other prizes until she eventually left. Oh, I but... didn't think much of old... Um, what was the husband called? Carl, was it? Played by John Mitchie. I didn't... He he never excited me. I just, like... I didn't mind them all, but the trouble with it was, was that Stella Price was played by... Michelle Collins. Who was a massive EastEnders fan. And Coronation She was not, not just that, she was actually so. in it. She was in it, yeah. She was that <laughs> massive... Massive think... EastEnders actress. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, she, the, the, Coronation Street kind of treated this like it was a coup that they managed to win her over to their show. And it just kind of, from the very beginning, I think it put a lot of people's backs up because it felt a bit like Cory didn't have any faith in its own actors. And they were going, look, we've got somebody who's good from a good soap. But I don't think that was the impression they wanted and to And she could do a really good Mancunian accent as well. Just listen to her. Oh, Spoiler, she couldn't. She, I remember she, uh, Michelle and, uh, and, she did about and John had to go on the TV to try and defend her accent. People were so really? up in arms about I don't, I don't remember thinking it, it wasn't was that, that bad, to be honest. But then it I, wasn't I, good, I suppose but if I, bad. I think if I was a native Mancunian, I'd be able to hear it more. I mean, I still can't tell the difference between which characters have got Lancaster accents and which ones have got Yorkshire accents. <laughs> it was really bad. But, so I, I didn't mind this one too much. But the, the problem was she was just such a boring character 
and she was brought in as as a newbie to run the rovers. Yeah, that was the other like, thing. No, you got to earn your position on she the rovers. She just kind of like got given the the sort of the keys to the castle, and we were all told that she was, you know, the, our new queen. And everyone went, "No, I don't think so." Mm. And she was so bland that even her wardrobe was beige, and that was the running joke on on the podcast <coughs> or for us in our house that she was just the most beige person and even poor Eva who turned out to be a really good and interesting fun character she didn't have the best of starts did she well when we first started watching Eva you didn't even know she was for like half a year you kept saying who's that girl and behind the bar and I was like I forgot I think that's his, her daughter yeah this was before we had the podcast though so we, we didn't need to remember everyone's names <laughs> no but um <clears throat> yeah very yeah, we- um but bad, bad misstep. Yeah, but it also involved another bit of, of semi retconning in that um, it turned out that this person was Leanne's mum and uh, Leanne finds out on her um, 30th birthday that... She's got a whole family that she didn't even know existed. Yeah, we, we d- I don't think we knew who Leanne's mum was supposed to be. I can't remember what, whether it was mentioned beforehand, but then we were supposed to... Just by the fact that Stella and Les Battersby had spent the night together, and yeah, as if. Leanne was the fruit of their union. Yeah, the only good, the good. Well, we got Eva out of this, and we also got the the Battersby trio of Leanne, Eva, yeah. and Toya, which were really fun for a very brief period of time mm. before they got rid of Eva. I think it's funny reading reading this that Leanne finds that she's Stella's daughter on her thirtieth birthday, and thinking. Oh, we're, we're like 36 and 37 now. And sure. I remember thinking that Leanne was, oh, so much older than us when this happened. I thought she's the same age as us. Well, I think she's supposed to be, a few, she's she's a few years older than us now. I suppose she always was, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, looking back on that, it's like, oh, um, what else did we have? Dennis Tanner came back into it uh, that yeah. year. Um, now that didn't go well. I mean, I think it was, <clears throat> I can't remember whether it was 2012, 2013 when he left, but uh, that was cool having um, Philip Lowry back on the show and he actually got a Guinness World Record for having the longest gap between playing the same character in fiction or something like that because it had been like 42, 43 years maybe since he'd been in it last. Uh, and I think that it all came about when Philip Lowry was doing some um, talking head bits around the 50th anniversary and then his age, or well, he kind of showed an interest in, in doing it again. And his agent spoke to Corey's people and that's how they got him back. And, and it'd be interesting if that sort of thing happened <laughs> again, like say, with Kevin Kennedy. Kevin Kennedy's like, um, did you hear the story? And, of, and uh, others. Of Dennis Tanner. <laughs> yeah, I, I really enjoyed T- Dennis Tanner, well, the brief period he was back in it. And I, having not good. watched him in the 60s, obviously, at all, or, or seen any of the episodes since that he was in, um, he was a really uh, uh, cool... Um, it was nice to have an cheeky, older, yeah, cheeky old guy with a bit of a bit of a sense of fun. Um, yeah, he was he was a good character. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we well we look at other new characters that we had that oh, year. You, we also had Peter being an alcoholic, and they had an episode oh. Oh, in yeah. December where he was in every scene. Yeah, and I'd forgotten about that one until until I was doing the notes for this the other the other day. Like but to yeah, encourage a, a special Peter centric episode. A very special Peter episode. Yeah, so he ends up falling off the wagon at the end of it. Um, yeah, I was just going to say some other new characters that we had that year. That was uh, two thousand and eleven. Was the introduction of the Tinkers. Beth and Craig made their first appearance in two thousand and eleven. Uh, we had Kirsty Soames, um, who I think would I think the domestic abuse story. Um, made more of an sort of yeah. started probably the, the following I would year. also if you haven't seen what Craig was like when he first came <laughs> in it you really need to look it up on YouTube yeah. because he was just this sullen chavvy yeah like, he really was he didn't like even like a speak, goon did child he? who just I had think, a rat I think Craig only made two appearances in 2011 and he might not even been credited and I don't think he has said anything either he's like or, he communicated by grunts. like yeah grunting and waving his fists around yeah or something yeah he's, like he's definitely grown up since then um, it's a lot more lovable now. And that year, we also saw uh, we also had Sylvia Goodwin as well, Roy's mum. <gasps> so the secret. They're, they're gradually child. dripping in extra bits of family for, yeah. uh, for Roy. They've aren't been they, doing it the for. They've been. Yeah. It's because Roy's such a, a loved. Yeah. Uh, person, Anything to hijack character. that rep. Um, lots of departures that year, actually. Um, Betty, um, <coughs> although again, Betty t- Betty um, Driver had died the previous year. It was two thousand and eleven that. Betty died in the program because um, she she'd had a massive period where 
she was still supposedly working at the Rovers and they kept referring to her being there, but yeah, we all knew that room. she wasn't. And it was like a bit, mm. a bit like, just don't mention her. Yeah, I don't need to bring it up. <laughs> um, just say she's in the woods And, and they brought back, um, they brought back her son, Gordon, to, to make an appearance for a funeral as well, which was pretty cool. Um, we said goodbye to Bill Webster that year. Liz McDonald made one of her many exits in 2011. Um, Cheryl Russ and Chris, who just appeared that year, disappeared Bye. now. This is when um, they had the story with Chris saying he had a brain tumour and he he was using it, I think, to manipulate Cheryl yeah, to go was. back to him. Cheryl. Cheryl to go back to him and, and she did. And Roy, yeah. was, not Roy, Lloyd. Lloyd was left heartbroken. I feel he really left. bad for Lloyd. I w- he, he's another one where I think it feels like so long ago. It's all... That, that he was in it. I know. And, and, and like, can oh. I even believe that he was in Coronation Street, Craig Charles, who I loved growing up watching Red Dwarf. And he, he, was, he was in it. it for quite a long period was, of time. He, he was really good in, the in like... He was great in the although Tim, Tim, Eileen and Steve are all really good together and really natural and stuff. Still, to me, the dream team in, in, the, Switch, in the Switch... Yeah. It, is Lloyd, Steve and Eileen. Yeah, they were fantastic. I'd love Lloyd to come back one day. Um, Not going to happen. I know, I know. Uh, Janice left that, that year. Oh, she uh, can come back. She went off with her bin man, Trevor. Oh, lovely. Um, Kieran, I think that was the last time that we saw him as well. Went off on a cruise we also, ship, really. he, he did go off on a cruise yeah. ship. I think he was going to get married to Michelle and then she decided she that she like... wanted to stick around for another nine years. <laughs> But we also had a few returns that year as well. We got to see Violet. Um, what was her surname? Violet. I'm thinking Wilson. Violet. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking Violet Carson. It was Violet Wilson um, <laughs> and Jamie Baldwin and Dylan. Um, and and uh, this was in a special episode at around Easter time, I think, which was on a Sunday. And Curry wasn't usually on on Sundays at, at that time. But they had a couple where they experimented with the Sunday episode. And this was Sean going down to London to see his son Dylan. Uh, and so they had the, those characters back in again, which was quite nice. Um, Marcus Dent as well came back into it, although I think he made a, a longer return. I think at the end of the year he came back and, and stayed on the street then. Todd made a brief reappearance with his posho boyfriend Jules. Um, and Tommy Duckworth was back on the street in 2011 as well. So um, although it was... I don't think anything could have topped 2011... Or no, nothing like the year following. It was always going to be a bit more of a, a letdown. That 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 wasn't a bad year, to be honest. You're going to say this about every single one. I'm I'm not because okay. looking at 2012, which oh. which was the year that the podcast started, that there's not as much there that I'm looking at and then, and saying, oh yeah, that was brilliant. 2012 was the best year of my life. Olympics. I just had a really great year. I just remember... Royal wedding. Just remember thinking... Podcast oh, starting. This is great. Um, <laughs> this is... Like, everyone was happy in the summer. I had great shoes. I wasn't fat. We were, <laughs> we were married. Yeah, we had the, the royal wedding. Most of the people I like were still alive. <laughs> <laughs> All those celebrities. Oh, no, I was talking about family. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, you know, all good things come to an end. But in the world of Coronation Street, um, this was when... The big story this year was the Kirsty and Tyrone's domestic abuse. And mo- I think a lot of the years that we've done the podcast, there's been one big story that really stands out above all others in the but year. But this and... was before... we Didn't we start the podcast in August? And this yes. happened around Easter, I thought. No, no, I think I think well, it might have started around then, but it went through the year because it wasn't until beginning of 2013, spoiler for next week's middle section, that that came to a head. Oh, OK, but, I'm um, thinking of the next year. Because I remember it was earlier in the year when uh, it all sort of went yeah. wrong. But that, was, that was good, and, and that really did show um, how underused Alan Halsall had been on the show because he got, like, nominations and awards and everything for Best Actor. And... Well, I mean, since then, they've not stopped using him in every scene. Uh, yes, they certainly have. <laughs> uh, but that I, I, I liked... Um, <clears throat> I, I was really gripped by that. And I, and I remember... That there weren't lots of flares up of Kirsty's temper, but I remember whenever it did happen, it was, like, a really electric moment, like, when she's smacking him with the, with the Hoover hose. Yeah, the Hoover hose. Pose. And there was the, didn't she throw a... A, Did she a, push him down the stairs or something yeah. happened at the stairs? I think that I think Top again the stairs. that was in the beginning of the next year as well. She oh. fell down the stairs. She threw um a, a silver 
Baby's rattle or something. I can't remember. Oh, but, not one from Tiffany's. But um, I, that was a that was a really really well done story, I think, and I and I enjoyed Fizz's involvement in it as well. And I know not a lot of people did, but that that to me was the main thing that I think of uh, for two thousand and twelve. Before we started the podcast, um, we had uh, Becky leaving, which is sad. I love Becky so much. That was a real end of the era. She she was your favourite character, yeah. wasn't she? I remember when we, before we started the podcast, she you were always say Becky. She is my I don't my number think one I've girl. Ever liked anyone? Even Carla in her heyday I didn't you know? Want as good what as Becky. did you like about Becky? <sighs> she was just the. She was just the like the ultimate Coronation Street like um, loud mouthed. Well, she was charismatic as well. She was her own She's worst really enemy. Charming. She had so many ups and downs and dramas, and she could play them all with absolute conviction. And you felt she was such you were a with good her actress. every step of the way in her the depths of her despair and the heights of her giddy excitement. Like when she's shouting with her tutu dress on, getting I'm getting married, and then the next minute she's drunk in a cell. Yeah, yeah. She she was awesome, and um, that. Anything to do with her was a was a highlight in the, well, the period I mean, that she was on, but it's no Catherine wonder Kelly. that she's she's gone on to do to do big things afterwards. Yes, um, but yeah, the the end of this kind of followed on from the story the previous year, where there was a bit of a love triangle between her and Steve and Tracy, and and I think and and Steve was supposed to be going out with Tracy, but he was no Steve was I get, I get confused. We... But basically, the, the 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 whole thing ends with Steve married to getting married to Tracy. Yeah, Tracy had had got pregnant and then she falls down some stairs and has a miscarriage but said that Becky had pushed her, didn't she? And nobody believed her. No. She didn't do it. No, well, I think people... No, people did believe her. And then um, Becky finds out by looking at Tracy's medical records um, that she... That's what I mean. Yeah, she'd had a miscarriage before she was pushed down the stairs and then she reveals this information to Steve on the wedding day. In the Rovers. Yeah, exactly. Before jetting off um, abroad with this new fella that she picked up. She had this brilliant episode. He's like, do you want to come and live with me on Barbados and run a hotel? And she gets her ending line of like, regrets there's for people who get their feet on the ground, we're heading for the stars or something. It's a real proper, like, classic Corrie icon (laughs) exit line. Um, and, uh, and she got to say goodbye in a plane. Yeah. She was she, actually in a plane. She she was Not so, many so characters good. get to actually get to the airport and sit in a plane. <laughs> um, that was also the year that we had the Frank Foster whodunit, which was memorable. And it was a kind of a cool way to have him to, to get rid of that character. I mean, if you're, if you're that kind of villain, you're usually going to get killed somehow, aren't you? But um, the, the way that, um, that that story was pulled off didn't quite work because they they brought it was one of those ones where they brought out their list of suspects and straight away we knew that it wasn't any of them or we highly suspected that it wasn't any of them and it turned out it wasn't it was actually his mum who i think we probably thought it was supposed it was going to be anyway so it was a bit a bit of a shame that we it was quite so predictable um but it was still quite exciting i think uh we had what else did we have? Oh, I've written here that this was when we had Betty's death. I thought the last year was Betty's death. Never mind. Betty died sometime around this this part of the decade. Um, we had we had Terry Duckworth coming back to set up his lap dancing club, um, and I suppose that everybody remembers the Bohemian Rhapsody scene that went on with Norris, was I it hated Norris and it. Roy and Mary and, and somebody else in there. Really I thought that dumb. was massively cheesy. I didn't like that. At it all. was Eileen. No, I don't know. I can't remember who it was. But it was. I, oh my uh, brains! Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Um, we had dirty, dirty cheese on toast. That was a that was a really interesting story with um, Eileen's bloke uh, Paul, Paul still being married to Leslie, he and it had... was a, it was a twist on the usual love triangle thing or yeah. the affair thing because Leslie had um, okay. Alzheimer's. Okay, was it early onset Alzheimer's? Yeah. So she didn't really know what was going on, and she wasn't. But she had like moments of being violent and. 
yeah. um, she she got confused because obviously she didn't know what was happening and she you felt sorry for her because she couldn't help it. But mm. also Eileen had to, like, Paul didn't know what to do because he wanted to pursue this relationship with Eileen, but he was still married to Leslie and he didn't want to yeah, leave her. Yeah, but it her. was a kind of a case of she's not the woman I married anymore. Yeah. And Eileen so, had to... She Eileen just had to, like, look after this poor woman and then she left her on her own and that's when Leslie died because she mm. put a toaster under the tap and um it was just a really interesting one of these the, the best soap stories are the ones where nobody's necessarily wrong or right mm, you're right actually to me yeah and, and, and that one there really wasn't um and it, like I said, it was an interesting twist on well, the usual kind of stories I, I thought the actress who played leslie was uh great was really really fantastic i i remember when she died and I didn't know that she was going to die. And I was like, no, she'll be fine. The, the ambulance is going to come and resuscitate her. And then she yep. actually did. She she had pegged it. I was like, oh, my gosh, that was a, that was a big shock death for me. I mm. uh, wasn't expecting that. Um, we had we had the surrogacy story starting that year, which was never that exciting, really, was it? Because it was an, an Izzy and Tina story. And like I said earlier, I was mightily sick of Tina by that point. Um, we had We had Mandy. Remember another second attempt at trying to get a, a family for Lloyd by introducing the uh, the woman that he'd apparently got pregnant many years before. So we had Jenna, his yeah, daughter, Jenna, who was utterly dull. Um, we had we had this. I mentioned him earlier, Marcus, who was a gay man. Oh yeah, yeah, he that was, was um, that, yeah. That was that was kind of interesting. He then fell in love with Maria. I think it was done relatively sensitively. That was also the time when Maria was supposed to have a cancer scare and then it turned out to be nothing. And I think that, as a viewer, felt like it was a bit of a, a bit of a well, damn squib. That happens to people as well. Yeah, I know it did, but they tried to make a load of drama out of it just for about two episodes. Wendy Crozier came back that year. That Who? Was Wendy Flaming Crozier, <laughs> although she was Wendy Papadopoulos at that point. That was that was a. It was interesting that the previous year they'd had Dennis Tanner, who hadn't been in the show for forty two years, and obviously Wendy Crozier it hadn't been anywhere near that long, but it had been a good like 20 odd years or so since she'd been in the show and they got the same actress back and she was a a big name wasn't she in, in classic 80s cory history with the affair that she'd had with ken so to bring her back and then bring back all those feelings for ken and deirdre and then have deirdre suspicious of ken um and he was he didn't want to have an affair with wendy but she was kind of preying on him i thought that was quite exciting um we had we had Rob Donovan come into it that year, Carla's brother. We had Gloria Price, who was in, added to the show to try and inject some kind of life into the uh, the Price family, but even she didn't go down particularly well. Um, well, she didn't she get involved in a scam with Audrey to test whether Lewis, he, Lewis Archer came back and Audrey didn't know whether he was true to her or not. And then... There was yeah, a that's scam. right. Yeah, Audrey and Gloria... Um, yeah, conspired together to was it Audrey? Yeah, to to make out that Gloria was dying to see whether Lewis would try and steal, steal her money, money or something. <laughs> because yeah, because Gail was going out with Lewis and Audrey was trying to prove to to Gail that a leopard never changes his spots. And I can't remember whether that was the year that that Lewis ended up leaving or whether that was two thousand and thirteen. I guess we'll find out when we do that next week. Um, well, Rosie left. Rosie left. That My year. lovely auntie Pam left. Yeah, well, Pam had Pam kind of half left Hobbs with Hobbsworth. Hobbs? She kind of half left in the previous year with uh, with Bill Webster, but then she showed up for a couple of couple of episodes. I just have this really vivid memory of her with her wicker basket full of sandwiches. I know, I know. She was great, and then and Amber. She also left that year, but um, I I never I never particularly enjoyed. Uh, was this the, was this Amber's first stint in it or her second? Because I remember I liked her a lot more. Initially, then she came back after she going to university, cow. and she was yeah. She was we also got bitch, Ruby this she? year as well. Oh yeah, of course we had Ruby <clears> being <throat> born because that was all part of the uh, domestic domestic abuse story. Um, Rick Nealon was in it that year. He, he came in for the uh, the the Terry Duckworth story. We had a Ryan Connor. We had a uh, a Ryan Connor. Sol Harris was the was the second Ryan appeared that year. I forgot to say the behind the scenes stuff earlier this year as well. And this two thousand and twelve was supposed to be the date when the Media City um, 
development was supposed to be finished, but they they announced that it was being postponed to 2014. So we got some more... The cobbles taking longer than we thought. (laughs) Um, And that was also the year that the midweek episode changed from Thursday to Wednesday. It's ruining the classic song by Harry Hill. Harry Hill, yeah, who mentions the Thursday date. Um, And there was also a musical called The Street of Dreams, which was narrated by Paul O'Grady. And it was like a potted history of Coronation Street, a bit like this Corrie musical, but it's not that one. Was this live performed by all these characters? Yeah, Kim Marsh was in it, Katie Kavner, who was Julie Carp, Julie Goodyear, uh, Kevin Kennedy, Brian Capra and all had parts in it. And it was launched in May, had two performances before being closed so that it could be reworked. It had middling reviews. And then it was never reopened again. Oh, I think the company behind it went bust or something. Well, and, imagine um, having to pay for Julie Goodyear's <laughs> fragile hairspray budget. <laughs> so yeah, that that got got uh, never even really got Sad. going. We we obviously never got a chance to. Say but that. we started. We haven't quit yet. We still we're still going somehow. Um, death door. Do you know I'm what I mean going. about 2012 not feeling quite so big as some of those mean. previous years? When when we were looking back at 2010 and 11, it's like, oh yeah, for, for for more stories. But it was an okay year. You've got to take the rough with the smooth, you know. Exactly, exactly. Everyone was watching the Olympics anyway. What's the point? Yeah, they don't need to. They need to distract us with Corey. So, oh, I forgot as well for 2012. That's this is that's when Sunita and Carl had their affair, which was. I, I didn't. I didn't like that. <laughs> um, and then and Stella started seeing Jason as well because yes, cause when, they were like Stella's boring. What should we do? Let's make her a cougar. Yeah, because Jason had been going out with Maria, but then when she tempts Maria, uh, Marcus over to the to the straight side, <laughs> Jason's like, I, I, I'm a bit of a third wheel there, and I'm, I'm going to go off and snog Stella. He's that, like, I don't know what to weird. do. I'm Mr. Gay Weatherfield. <laughs> Anyway, that was 2012, and I think that's a a good place to end our discussion this week, because that's where my notes run out. We'll be back next week um, with uh, talking about 2013, 14 and 15. So if you've got anything you want to add to this week's discussion or next week's discussion, just write in and tell us and uh, and we'll read them out. Um, But for now, that's it for that. Let's move on to the next section of the podcast.